So now over to um, Sergio, and Sergio is going to be talking about Libris 020, um, talking about a lot of new features that are coming and um, giving us a little bit of a demo of how, of how things work. So Sergio, over to you. Um, Sergio Morata from Superradios. And uh, today's talk, in, in today's talk, we'll look at the recent release of uh, Libris version 0 0.2. So the, the focus of the discussion will be about what's new. You know, 0 0.2 has a usual batch of fixes. It also has a few important enhancements. Uh, we'll, view, we'll view Libris overall functionality in a demo, uh, which will be the final part of the presentation. Uh, we'll use network emulation to create a very low network condition between two machines. And uh, that will allow us to see the robustness and efficiency of libraries in real time. Uh, but just as importantly, this release brings with it a degree of maturity that may surprise a lot of people. It's not just robust and efficient. It has a characteristic that warrants its inclusion in the standard media tool set that comes with Linux and other platforms. We'll be discussing that in the presentation uh, too. Okay, next. All right, so before we begin, we should mention that this library has truly a seven year history, right? Uh, it started as a patented commercial offering that was codenamed Dozer back in uh, 2014. For five years, this code base and the algorithms associated with this uh, for retransmission and congestion control were perfected and field proven with hundreds of real deployments that are still in use today of uh, live transmission, television channels, et cetera. Early last year, uh, you know, the code was basically modified to be risk compliant and uh, released as the first version of the Libris open source project like you know, was mentioned is BST, BST type two, very liberal license. Uh, for the next 12 months after that, uh, the open source for the risk library was field tested and optimized for cross platform and cloud use by a number of developers from many different parts. Uh, there was a very large community engagement in the uh, upgrade of the code base, as you can see by the number of commits in only one year, 750 or, or so. Uh, let's look at the fixes. You know, I'll pass for a moment uh, to let you read the bullets. A lot of these fixes have to do with efficiency uh, because the core identity of Libris is multi-stream, multi-path transport. We concentrate on efficiency uh, in network and CPU usage. And the secondary focus of the fixes in this release has been uh, you know, to make sure that we have proper cross-platform support. The main new features on 0 uh, 0.2 are in the areas of security, cross-platform performance, and jitter control. Uh, the security model gets a lot of our attention because we expect that people have a, a lot invested in the streams that use protocols like this, right? So our cross, uh, uh, we added uh, authentication based on the latest spec to cover that. Our cross compile support now reaches 18 platforms, pretty much everywhere where VLC compiles, we're tagging along and we're making sure that our library compiles as well. Uh, and we'll spend a little bit of time on the jitter prevention enhancements in the next few slides as well. As we mentioned, we put a lot of focus on network efficiency. Uh, one of the things we've learned over the years of doing error correction protocols is to step back and not contribute further when the network is already congested, right? Sending a lot of re-requests for drop packets is just shooting yourself in the foot if there are network problems. So we have timers that hold, hold off re-requests. We don't uh, send re-requests after the buffer time has expired if we see adverse conditions, plus other things to not make a bad situation worse. Uh, now, given a, a sizable buffer, we see Libris as making streams viewable 
even in conditions of 60 or 65% packet loss in, in, you know, in our lab tests. It's hard to reproduce that type of packet loss in, in, in a real line out there. Uh, now, related to adverse condition, we've added several time stamping behaviors in, in version 0.2 as well. Uh, these behaviors ensure that measured release of the stream to the output without jitter. We also mentioned the, the new authentication model, right? With previous releases, we already had AES encryption. But encryption only goes so far if the gatekeeper lets everybody in, right? So taking SRP and EAP as inspiration and specifically adapting the step-by-step -step challenge response methods of the two to a UDP connection, I think we built something that is really secure and it has to be. Uh, what Lupus can do in main fraud profile is to put the sender in a one-to-many promiscuous listening mode. It binds to a listening port and as many receivers and the, as the bandwidth and processor can support can receive from it, like the media server model. So given the low CPU usage of Libris compared to other error correction protocols, you might find that bandwidth rather than CPU will be the limiting factor when you do a, a deployment with this. Uh, we've included what we call an SRT password utility. utility. If you use the uh, HT password from Apache in the past, you'll have some idea on how, to, how it works. We follow that, that model pretty much. Each side offers a public key for verification over already an encrypted connection. So this is a robust security model. Before we talk about the future of li Libris, let's review where we stand. The key takeaway I want you to have is that it's, it's robust ability to transfer multiple streams over multiple paths. If you write to the library, you have no limit. You can implement uh, however many uh, connections you want, as you want. If you use the utilities we provide, the executables uh, with the command lines, uh, you can specify up to 20 RTP or UDP streams input or output on either side, and up to 20 tiers, no, I'm sorry, 10 tiers on the multipath connection itself. Uh, the, the tools provide load balancing and uh, weighting of the, of the different paths. Uh, they give you redundancy, split path, however you want to configure it. That has been there since 0 0.1, the first release of the library. And uh, with some of the network efficiencies in 0 0.2, they're even better now. So before we move into the uh, demo itself, let's take a very quick look at what's coming next for the library. It looks like Libris is going to find its place in the distros and important media software. Uh, we've been included in uh, the FreeBSD ports. Uh, we are already in the main code base of FF FFmpeg, uh, I believe 4.4 will have it. Uh, we're in the final stages of uh, you know, committing support for VLC 4.0. Whenever that will be released, uh, uh, can be much longer for that. And we are waiting word, uh, but we expect to be included also in the Debian repos. Uh, you know, we're definitely coming along well. So now let's go ahead and move to our demo portion. Okay, our demo portion is gonna be uh, quite a, a simple, straightforward demo. We have uh, two machines and a network emulator in between that will let us fine tune packet loss between the two machines. In the, in the first machine, we're gonna go ahead and start FFmpeg and stream uh, a video on a loop. We're gonna feed that, that video to the risk sender command line utility on the same machine. And then uh, you know, we're gonna receive it on the second machine and stream that video back to my laptop where I'm gonna show it on the screen. Okay. So let me go ahead and switch to that. When I open a console, all right. You can see here, oh, it's kind of small, but I have three tabs. The first two tabs are on the first machine and the third tab is on a second machine. Those are just SSH connections to the machines in question. Uh, next, I have a web page connected to our emulator user interface. So let's go ahead and start this, this demo portion. All right, so we'll start inside a console on uh, what will be our sender. 
the first thing I want to do uh, is to create a password file. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and show you a little script that I use to create a password file because part of this demo is going to be demonstrating the new security model. So go ahead and copy and paste. And I hope you can see that if it's not too small. Uh, there's a little script here that executes the utility risk SRP password multiple times with username and password. And each time it adds a line to our password file. Okay. Uh, if you're familiar with uh, Apache's HT password utility, it's something along those lines. So we're going to use this script to generate about 20 users. Okay. So now I'm going to just run that script here. Okay. The, the, the password file has been created. Let me go ahead and show it to you. It's this big uh, mess, uh, just one line per user, uh, the username, and then uh, uh, SHA-256 hash uh, of, uh, of the password itself. We never store the password in the clear. It's a one-way hash. Uh, and that's uh, you know, very well documented in the algorithm itself. Uh, we're going to uh, make this uh, demo sort of like a good exercise. We're going to allow uh, viewers to connect directly to the restreams if they want to. If you have, you have a Libris compiler handy, it's a short notice, but uh, you can just uh, open the streams yourself once we start. So we have a 1080p video. The sender will go into re uh, receive mode, meaning listening mode on a port connected to a network emulator. Then there will be a receiver connected on the other side. And then we'll start increasing the packet loss to severe levels using emulation till we see some loss packets. That's the gist of the demo, to show how robust the library is in adverse network conditions. For the audience participation, for those who have Libris uh, ready, the sender will listen at the same time uh, to an external port and you can use uh, the public IP uh, to connect to it. We'll post the, the, the link in the chat if anybody wants to open it up. All right, so let's go ahead. I'm gonna go ahead and start the stream, the FFmpeg uh, live video output. And I didn't start my timer. So if somebody Wes can, can uh, warn me when we're about five or 10 minutes away, I would appreciate it. All right, so I've started FFmpeg. I'm just streaming uh, a local video on a loop to uh, the same machine, the internal adapter 127.001. That's all I'm doing for now, right? Now I'm gonna go ahead and start this sender. I'm going to go ahead and copy and paste, but not start it so I can do a brief explanation of what I'm doing. All right, so I've uh, copied and pasted a, a resender command line. It's reading from the UDP that is being created by FFmpeg. And then I'm created, uh, creating the, the output itself to listeners uh, on uh, both the, the public IP of the machine and the second interface a second listener that is going through the emulator so that I can have the choice to go ahead and retrieve the stream with and without packet loss to see the difference uh, and, and to run more tests. So that this is all it's doing. It's one uh, input and two listeners, both, uh, you know, two, two outputs, both in listener mode. So I'm gonna go ahead and start that one. So for those who are familiar, dash I is for input, dash O is for output, okay? Uh, I've set up some parameters here. Uh, They're very close to the standards on the library as far as buffer size, one second, a reorder buffer of 25 milliseconds, put some boundaries in the RTT that it will measure even though it's dynamic. Our network emulator by default, I believe has 70 milliseconds in either direction. So it's a 35 millisecond round trip, which represents pretty much uh, any, you know, any connection out there. Uh, so let's go ahead now and look at their receiver. I'm going to switch to the other tab and, and make uh, the other machine that is in the other side of the network emulation. It's going to initiate a connection to the sender. So I have the risk receiver with minus I connected to the other machine and then the output 
of uh, this one, if you look at it here, the output is just going to my laptop across the internet on port 8300. Actually, I'm cheating because I'm in the same data center. So the connection from the RIS receiver to me is a solid you know, local area network, but that's fine since I'm using UDP, I want it to be a solid you know, connection with no packet loss. I want the packet loss to be only between RIS sender and RIS receiver. And you'll notice that I'm using the IP address that goes through the network emulator. There's another IP address that the sender is listening to, which people from the outside can connect now and, and run this test in parallel using their own connection and, and see how it behaves across the internet viewing the packet loss that goes through it. So I'm gonna go ahead and start this guy. We see that it connects with authentication. There's uh, the log. And then it starts spinning the messages once per second. This is, uh, uh, I'm gonna spend a few seconds here. Typically, uh, people are confused about what the stats tell them and the fact that it, they reset. The stats, they have two different groups. One of them shows the cumulative stats since you started the service, and it only shows very brief uh, cumulative information, total packets received, total packets recovered, and uh, lost packets, if any, since the start of the connection. You'll see that repeated every second, it prints the cumulative stats. But then the bulk of the stats, everything else you see there that is, you know, 20 or 30 parameters, they are the average of what happened uh, or the cumulative stats, but only for the last second. And then they reset and then you get another average of, for the next second and so on and so forth. So when you write your application, you can capture that, you know, those stats every second and be, build a graph over time of a lot of parameters. But if you don't want to capture it, you can have the cumulative stats for the very basic, most important information, which includes the total number of packet loss since the beginning of the service itself. And we see here that it says zero, as expected, right? Uh, let's look at the the output of that, it's going to my machine. So I'm gonna go ahead and have my VLC listening in 83, port 8300, and I just started it. Okay, now Zoom is only 12 frames per second, I think or so, if you're lucky. So the, the video itself is 30 frames per second. You won't be able to appreciate it very much, but the point is it plays, it plays normally, there's no packet loss, right? Uh, when you receive it, if you want to do it over your own internet connections with the link that we gave you, you can see it uh, full screen with your own uh, machine. And we have uh, uh, somebody standing by, they're going to copy and paste the command last into the chat for you. All right. So now let's switch up to the emulator itself, which is the last piece component on the demo. So here's the GUI of the emulator. This is our proprietary hardware. It's a nice uh, little six port fanless i7 mini PC. Uh, we also have a one, a one U or, and a four port uh, emulator as well, smaller, uh, that we use for our own uh, you know, testing of uh, links. Uh, we're gonna start with a 1% packet loss, which is what you see here. And uh, there's 17 milliseconds on each side. You see delay 17 milliseconds. This uh, connect LAN 2 and LAN 3 are the ones that form the bridge for this connection. I'm only gonna be uh, changing the packet loss in one direction. But we have the, the delay of 17 milliseconds in both sides to simulate a true uh, internet link. All right, uh, okay. In, in our case, we chose 17 milliseconds because it mimics a New York to Los Angeles transit in a very good network, in very good network conditions. So uh, let's flip to the sender console, if you can read this over Zoom, uh, and we'll see that the sender itself is gonna report the number of retransmission, the quality at 1% packet loss, we see the quality of the link reported by the tool, uh, we see send 240, uh, retransmitted three, right? So there's a, a small percentage of retransmissions uh, as expected every second. And uh, on the receiver, on the stats, we see that those are all recovered and the cumulative loss uh, remain at zero. You can see the cumulative stats right here, recovered 710 since we started, loss zero. And then if we do the, the analysis by the second, uh, then we see what's happening there. 
and here's the video. So now we're just going to go ahead and increase that to 10% bracket loss, all in one shot. Oops, 10% bracket loss, apply. Now, the reason we know this actually did something is because we can immediately see in the stats running through the screen here on the bottom that the quality dropped to 90 as expected with 10% packet loss. We see received uh, 329, missing 38. You know, all of them are being recovered. Still, the cumulative loss is zero. And you can see the video on your screen uh, still doesn't have any issues whatsoever since there's zero packet loss. So let's go ahead and go to 20. Now we have 20% uh, packet loss. There was a small glitch during transition and we lost one packet when I guess when we reset the variables. Let's turn VLC off here. Let's see. We can see the event that we saw on the, on the video itself. We can see how it affected. Just one packet loss can affect like a receiver, which is what we saw here when we switched to 20% packet loss. So we can see that the uh, stream is still holding strong. And we can go all the way up to 50 and see how it still has no issues are recovering from the stream. Yeah. So what are you restarting, Sergio? I'm restarting. Apparently, we had a, a small uh, problem with the sender. It had a crash. I guess we need a, to report a bug to the library. Oh, OK. So something happened, and we had a crash on the sender. I can, I can, also... I can make an introduction for, to the guy who wrote it. Yeah, yeah. I don't know what they were thinking. Huh? All right. So you get the gist. You know, it's uh, all the way to fifty. Uh, authentication works. Everything else works. So I don't know how much time it has. I forgot to start my. Uh... You got about five minutes, Sergio. Okay, perfect. I want to leave a little bit for Q and A. But okay, the, the the stream is back up and running. Ten percent packet loss, uh, and the video's on. So now let's go back here. I'm going to go straight to 50 and then conclude it there so I can have some, a Q&A. Oh, I think it's a simple question. He's asking, uh, what is the official link to the Librist uh, repository? You can, uh, do you want to put the answer into the Q&A, Sergio? Uh, or, or? The, the, here, uh, have it here. It's an, actually an ecosystem. The library itself is part of uh, the ecosystem. The ecosystem includes wrappers to use the, li the libraries in different languages. So you have the library, Librist, and then you have the library wrapper for Rust, uh, for Python, for C++. Uh, we have a Wireshark plugin, et cetera. So I'll just put it on the chat. OK, yeah, yeah. You, you, um, Monty, if you, if you indulge us, we'll do that after um, Sergio is done. He can do that while he gets a sip of his coffee and can relax a bit. Um, so the question I had for you, Sergio, um, you were showing us some performance numbers and things like that. Would you say that? the buffers that you use are typical or extreme or, or what, what did you need to, how did you configure your, your buffers in order to get the performance we were seeing? We, we have the, the library itself has some defaults and those are pretty much the ones I'm using now. I mean, very, very close to the defaults. I believe we only changed the max RTT so that it wouldn't go too far above a certain value, but we, we made sure the library itself was fine tuned the parameters inside and the default values uh, for the sweet spot. Sweet spot in, in, the, in the library point of view is from zero to one gigabits per second as far as uh, the amount of bandwidth it can handle. And from you know zero to 60 or 65 percent packet loss without any problems, we can do that with one, a one second buffer. You know, you know, if, if the round trip time is within reason, right, right like mm -hmm. the one I'm showing here, 30 to 50 millisecond round trip, that's with a one second buffer, you can, you know, navigate through that sweet spot without any problems, without changing any parameter. And that's important because when they include the library in, in other tools like FFmpeg and VLC, most likely people will not you know, tweak those parameters when they use it. Right, 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 right. So, so if, if somebody was to tweak the parameters, uh, do you have any feel for uh, what kind of packet loss you might be able to tolerate if you were, let's say, sending a, uh, a five gigabit or a 10 gigabit signal? Well, for the higher bit rates uh, above one gigabit, 
it's not only parameters you have to tweak. You have to actually compile the library and tweak some of the internal constants for the library to react faster, et cetera. And even, even in such case, I believe for the higher bit rates, realistically, you cannot get to the high levels we get right now. Yeah, my you're probably not going to get to 50% back at once. No, no. I mean, my guess is that 10 yeah. to 20% will be, you know, the sweet spot when you go above one gigabits per second up to five or 10 or whatever it is. Yeah, sure. That makes sense. But the, the good news is that all those all those tools and tweaks and handles are all available in the code, right? Correct. It's all open source. It's, uh, you know, documented. It can, you, we need to do a little bit more on documentation, but it's good enough for anybody to implement it directly, like a lot of people have done, a lot of companies, or use the tools if that's if that's the way you want to do it. You can do that as well. The tools and the library are both BSD type 2, so you can use them both in your projects. Great. And um, so about how many people do you think are contributing to Libris right now? Have you? Last time I checked, we had a, a, at least uh, 15 to 20 active uh, developers that in, in one time or another have contributed to the code. Uh, the, one of the important things is that we see a lot of uh, company uh, sponsored uh, contributions. We have people from- That's Apple, great. We have people from, you know, they, they pick companies that have an interest that use the library in themselves, they actually make a point to contribute back. You know, they, they put time, pay some of the developers to help us out or to uh, report bug fixes as merge requests, which means they not only they not only take the time to report the bug, they actually fix it and send us the code to merge it, which actually gives them, uh, you know, the, puts their name in the library and the library being, you know, at this point, you know, uh, mostly for companies to integrate, uh, if somebody contributes to the library, we are allowed to put their company name as part of the, you know, one of the contributors. So it's a little bit of free marketing that they get uh, for prosperity, having the company name as part of the code base. Well, that's great. L little uh, little uh, path to fame, I guess, huh? Yep. All right, great. Um, anybody else have any questions? was a great presentation. One final question. Uh, is there any ch discussion channel, place to post questions? We do. We have a Slack channel uh, that is the main risk channel. We, we hijacked it to be a Libris as well. Uh, the official one is a Telegram channel called Libris on the core developers. You know, that's where the core developers just chat and argue and you know, debate about- <laughs> Argue. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's good to have people that don't think like you. Otherwise, you know, you'd make a big mess. I'd make a big mess, you know, if I didn't have the, the other people stopping me from adding everything I can think of. Well, that's great. Um, Sergio, thank you very much. Um, that was really, really interesting. And um, if you want to uh, stay on a little bit and maybe um, if you have any resources you want to share in the chat window, I'll um, go ahead or the Q&A window, uh, we'd love to have you um, have you do that.